Good morning, folks. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for uh, being here. And if you are uh, all returning, I guess the pressure's on. The pressure's on, yeah. The bar, the bar has been raised, and that is somehow I'll do my best. My name is Michael McGuire. I'm a faculty associate. I teach uh, across the street in the School of Human Ecology, a little bit up the hill. If you haven't been to our building, I welcome you to the coolest place on campus. Uh, as shared by many students and many visitors. Uh, it's a great space, I think, for learning, for thinking about learning, for being engaged in learning, and that's true of staff, of students, and faculty. We take pride in the investment that our donors and staff have made in the building because in terms of a learning environment and spaces, it, it does mean a lot for the space that you're in. So you're welcome to join us across the way. This morning, as John and I were just uh, connoitering before we started, I'm going to share a bit of a combination of pedagogical and andragogic philosophy about equity in student assessment and some pragmatic Canvas grading scheme tools and how those two come together. That was sort of my charge in talking about uh, having some presence here with the Active Learning Lab. Um, so Active Teaching Lab and Learning, we'll, we'll cover both. So uh, John does, I think, a nice job for us uh, prompting the questions of what I want, what I tried, uh, what I'd do differently, and I'm going to um, frame what I share with you uh, in that way and hopefully offer at a minimum some thinking about equity and student assessment and how grades can be actually a part of that because uh, my first focus philosophically is that in higher ed and on this campus in the name of decentralized approaches to our work and in the name of academic freedom Sometimes our students can get caught up in what, in my opinion, can result in inequity when it comes to grading. And here's how that looks. This goes to what I wanted. Um, I've taught undergraduates since 1994, and I will be the first to admit that that informs some of what I do now as a teacher. Um, and can in some ways represent the conversion of me. And um, when I started to really reflect on where that comes from, it really comes from a place of wanting to reach some equity in authentic assessment of students' work. And here's how that looks. Um, how do students get grades in higher education? What do grades look like? In higher ed, we have this um, concept that's based on uh, grade point and this 4.0 grade point scale. And that's how we grade. That's, that's the how. That's how we grade. That's what grades look like. So this is where I start when I start to think about grades. That from the official institutional university perspective, as is designated under the purview of our registrar, this is the university grading system grading scheme. Where I got tripped up in teaching undergrads is that if this is what ends up on the student's uh, transcripts, if this is the transcripted grade and university grading scheme, how have we ever ventured into this 100% uh, point based way of grading? And what does that mean? In my opinion, here's what it means. It means that we have ultimately degrees earned that are measured by a university grading system that, in my opinion, if you think about it logically, it's inequitable. It's dependent on the grader. And it starts to divorce us from, I think, what we reflect on a transcript for a grade. So what do I mean by that? You and I know. In the name, again, of being decentralized and academic freedom, everybody can determine what the scale is up to 100 percentage point. So for me, you know, a 92 to 100 percent with professor number one is an A. Uh, an 87 to a 91 is an AD. You know, an 83 to a, et cetera. And then you go to professor number two, and it's a 95 to 100 is an A. 
and a 90 and a 94 is an AP. And, and my experience has been that in academic departments, it may be untrue for you, but there are not a lot of good conversations, I think, about what we're reflecting in our pedagogy for authentic assessment and equitable assessment of students' performance. To say that, well, as a department, let, let's agree on what our grades are going to be reflecting based on the GPA scale. So having beat my head against that wall enough, I thought, I'm going to do my version of this if I can. And to find a learning management system that would actually cooperate with me with that <laughs> was, I found, somewhat futile. And quite honestly, uh, it was a matter of uh, priority in labor, how much time did you want to spend on developing this? Because I found, for instance, with D2L and the grade scheme modules used there, it was an algorithm that was, quite honestly, beyond me. I'm a smart person, but I'm not that smart. I, I you know, was uh, uploading an Excel spreadsheet with, it just got to a point of, and frankly, when I talk about priority in labor, as a faculty associate, all I do is teach. So every semester I teach four three-credit undergraduate classes. My enrollments are usually between 150 and 170 students total per semester. Um, it's a lot of teaching, but that's all I do. I, I don't have the pressure of publishing. I don't have the pressure of facilitating grants um, or doing research. It's, it's my gig. It's what I love to do. So, but I have to prioritize those, those tasks associated with instruction. And this is one where I've just settled on what works for me and was happy to find through significant help with KK last summer that uh, Canvas can help accommodate this a little better as a learning management system. So here's how that works. I wanted equity and grading based on the EW GPA scale. Um, here is, and if this is fuzzy, it's meant to be for, for, for reasons, et cetera. Uh, but this is how a transcript looks. This is what ends up with a student for ad infinitum beyond their graduation when they earn a grade in our course. This is what lives. So this is why, philosophically, I thought, there should be some standard or some basis. Here it is. And we say it's a 4.0 scale. So uh, these are the semesters. Here's fall, spring, I think there's a summer in there. Um, and over here, we have the credits earned. We have the letter grade assigned. These are the A, A, B, 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 C, et cetera and the equivalent, or the uh, commensurate GPA points, okay? At the bottom, there's a summary. And the summary is, as you know, I'm, I'm stating some obvious here, but undergrad CUM credits, uh, CUM GPA credits, uh, undergrad CUM grade points earned, and then the big number, undergraduate GPA. And one of the things to notice about this, this matters in my scheme, uh, grading scheme that ends up on Canvas, is that this get, actually gets carried out on the transcript to the thousandths place value. Here's how that matters and how it works for me. So believe it or not, on this campus since teaching, uh, uh, with teaching since 19, uh, 2004 on this campus, this is my grading scale. It's based on the official university GPA scale. I carry out these grades to the hundredths because then it gives me some flexibility with how I grade assignments, how students earn a grade in a semester or a semester grade. And I'll show you how that looks. Um, so here's the uh, official university registrar GPA values for grades, the commensurate letter grades that go along with them. Um, and these are the ranges that are consistent with those numbers that I use when I assign the grades that student earn, students earn on assignments. Uh, now, where it's helpful to have it to the hundredths is, as you can imagine then, if you have 10, 12, 15 assignments throughout the semester, and those points start to accrue, it does start to get to finer detail of what if the final grade is, uh, because of the math, a 3.12. It didn't quite make it to 3.2 far, and the B range, it's in the BC range. So that's where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. And that's where you can somewhat sophisticate what you're doing with grading. So no wonder, Michael, you didn't find an LMS <laughs> that did this well. Um, but I also have had 
feedback from students, and this is what I've asked for in mid-course evaluations, at end-of-course evaluations, and uh, in conversations regularly with alumni. When they get there and see this and look at their transcript, they get it. It's like, oh, yeah, at first I thought it was quirky. I mean, I'm used to doing 100 percentage points and totally getting that. And then I have to figure out and navigate which professor has which 100 percentage point for which letter grade. But this makes sense. And as long as I'm certain to have this in the syllabus at the start of the semester, to offer opportunities and office hours for students to review and engage where they're at. Yes? So, <clears throat> I want to make sure I understand this. So when I assign grades, I sort of think of it like walking up a set of steps. And if you get to a 3.0, or you get to the points in my course that would equate to a 3.0, then you get a B assigned to your transcript grade. If you have a 2.95, you didn't get the 3 0, you didn't make it up that next step. So you're still sitting on the step below, which in this case would be a BC. Okay? The way I'm interpreting this is that you actually sort of use a range within your course, and that someone who gets a B could have earned anything between a 2.75 and a 3.24. Is that right? Or am I missing Right. Anything? No, you're right. And it's a way of uh, translating the official 4.0 scale, and that's the foundation of it, not a 100 percentage point scale, because you'll see how that works in, okay. in the Canvas. Okay. Uh, that's, that's a really good observation. So how does that translate to Canvas? It translates this way. So I've plugged in the math that I just shared with you. I've plugged this into my grading scheme in Canvas, and I'll uh, get it up in a second. But you know when you establish an assignment, and it's as simple as this. This is where Kate gave us, like, light dawns on Martha, Martha Day. Um, where you're able to, dis you have options for how you display grades. I display grades as letters. And have shared with students that this is the scale those letters are based on. And this is what you, this is how you earn. Now, what certainly adds to the sophistication is how you weight grades, how you might, towards the end of the semester, weight some things with more uh, of a percentage weight. That's another thing I like about the Canvas module for grading scheme. But this is how the grade will display. And it will actually, the, the added piece, this is a bonus, it will actually show the points <coughs> per assignment on that four point GPA scale. And this is how it does that. In the grade book, when the students look at their grade, they'll see they got an A. And the, the particular assignment, this is an assignment grade, um, was a 3.8 out of 4. And if you go back to my scale, 3.8 out of 4, oh, let's see, oh, that's an A. That's where it is. So I've allowed for, that's what I meant about carrying to the hundredths, I've allowed for, in, in a way, it's a different way to do 100 percentage points. But what it does that other LMS, I, at least in my practice, haven't seen is it, it, it essentially finds a workaround to ignore percentage based on 100 percentage point. The basis, and this is where I get into the, the philosophy of it, I think at a minimum it can prompt us to think more about uh, professional conversations about teaching and learning, how we assess and how we get to better equity. If we're using the foundational quantitative measurement piece, of what ends up being the official transcript grade anyways, why should we be reinterpreting that per course? Here's another way, that I might be stating the obvious, but that it, it, it addresses the equity issues. So there are how many sections of English 101? Which means, in a decentralized campus, there might be that many dozens, hundreds of scales for determining a final grade for that course. What if students are doing? Students are doing the same amount of work. It's all dependent on the grader, and I'm arguing that it really shouldn't be. There should be some standard where we say, based on things like the essential learning outcomes and so we're going to assess. There should be some standard we we can we can default to, versus depending only on the grader. That feeds into another philosophical issue I have. Uh, you know what students do now at this season? You know what they're doing? Trying to figure they're, out what it takes to get an A. And how are they doing that? 
pragmatically. They're counting backwards. Um, here's <laughs> what I'm thinking. Spring 2018, registration is coming up. Courses have already been uh, n named in the course guide. Registration hasn't happened. You know what they're doing? I don't know if you're all aware of this. Might be stating how this again. But through the registrar's office, they can actually look at the grade distribution of every course. That's what they're doing. And look, they're looking for the higher grade distribution to find out who's the easier grade. Sorry, I don't want to disappoint us that they go. They want to take our class. Yeah, they do. Many do. They're sincere in that effort. But that's what I'll, I mean, that is, help me understand. That is so antiquated. Why are we even doing that? Why are we even sharing that information? Another thing a lot of LMS do, I haven't quite gone through all of Canvas with this, but um, D2L used to do this, and you have to go in and set. It defaults to displaying class averages. Then we get into this dimension of assessment competition versus authentic, authentic assessment of caring about how well I'm doing with the content of this course. Students want to know, okay, how did I, and again, I don't want to get too far off track, but it just feeds into a way of assessment that's really not focused on authentic assessment, I don't think. It's a distraction of preoccupying students with this phenomenon of going to the registrar's office, seeing who's easier. Why shouldn't they be concerned, or more concerned, in a better sense, about the content of courses in the curriculum and care about what they're going to learn. They do. We know that. I want to give some benefit of the doubt. But why do we add that piece to it when it comes to assessment? So anyways, this is how uh, the Canvas tool has worked. This is how it gets displayed. Um, I'll go back to my questions in the lower right. So I wanted a scheme that was consistent with the transcript scheme that's through the registrar's office. Again, inspired by my interest in student assessment equity and authentic assessment. Um, what I tried is applying my own GPA-based 4.0 scale from the transcript. This is what it looks like in my scheme in Canvas. Oh, and so here is what I was just saying about uh, exposed only to me as the instructor of record is this default system of percentage over here. Ultimately, this becomes irrelevant. Students don't see this and don't need to. It wouldn't confuse them. It used to confuse them in other elements, and I added another workaround for them. Here's what you need to pay attention to. But now, if I display grade as letter, it defaults to here. And then it will give the points out of four that they earned on that assignment. There. So what I do differently, um, it's early. This is, I just started with Canvas this past summer and uh, dip my toe with a uh, lower labor on the LMS system um, internship class where the primary work of students was, was out and about and we did a lot of things that were uh, discussion based and online. So this semester is the first time I've done it with my four classes over the Canvas platform and I guess so far so good. Can I ask another question? Yeah. You, you said for that one assignment you don't you don't show the students what your um, scale is for a given grade, right? I show them that. That's in the syllabus. That's where they'll know, and I give myself to the 100th point um, for primarily the accrual of assignments over a semester, so it really comes down to it. If they've earned an A, their, their accumulative GPA is going to be 3.75 or above. Um, so they see this and they know this. They know it's a four-point scale and this is what the four-point scale is based on. And this is consistent with the registrar's official scale. Has it changed the number of students that come to you and say, but <laughs> and try and get an extra point <laughs> or whatever it is? Has it changed that at all? Oops. Oh, I'm, um, I'm sorry, did I jump ahead in your no. presentation? <laughs> no, I hit the wrong advance button. I don't know why it's not complaining. Um, but that's my so far so good. That's what I was going to say. So far, it's been, uh, it, it makes more sense. Um, so they're not, they're I, coming to you less than they used to, or they didn't used to do that anymore? <clears throat> I think they're coming to me less. Okay. And it's one of those, uh, I don't have my entourage of people with me helping. You know, right, right, it's like, right, right. From what I recall, yeah, I think so. I think uh, it. it I found it definitely easier, and with that display, um, I'll, I'll get the 
to justify to them what they with that uh, yeah. display of the grade, they know then, oh yeah, I got a three point eight that's based on the scale. Okay. In that column, they don't see the three point eight, three point seven five, you added that, right? No, I believe uh, it shows the student view, it, go, it shows it just like this. Oh, and there's the out of four. Yeah. So, uh, but they know that they earned an A or this student an A, B. But is there, a, is there some sort of a rubric or something for the student to know what do I have to do to get a three point? Yes, eight? absolutely. Good point. I think yeah. we're required on campus to provide students with a grading scale that lets them know kind of what they need to do to get a given grade. Now, I think your other scale says that it's 3.75 to 4. Yeah. I mean, in essence, you've converted a 100-point scale to a 4-point scale. Exactly. Um, yeah. But I'm just wondering, do you, have you yet had students come to you and say, you know, I, I know <coughs> what a 90% means, but I don't know what a 3.6 means. Yeah. Um, so two points occur to me. One, you're absolutely right, and best practices say, and I do all rubrics with assignments that will go through that very thing, and give the scale what it looks like. It can be a uh, challenge with some uh, community-based courses that are not um, uh, content quantifiable based, like some of the sciences and math. And, uh, and it can be done with a good rubric, you're right. Um, the other thing I'd add, a caveat to your, your observation is required. In a decentralized campus where academic freedom is rule of the day, often not. We might say it is, but right. for Thanks instructor, so we can yeah. pretty much determine what that 100% is. Right. That's why I can do this, because you're right. I interpret that 100 percentage points, 100 percentage based grading scheme on a four point scale. I just translated that down. And it's not arbitrary, it's based on what they're going to see on the campus. The thing that I think is really cool about this is in translating it to a rubric then, because if you have a 100% rubric with 100 different things there, that's hard. But to have like a four point rubric, you know, did you earn four points? Did you do a three job? Did you do a two job? Did you do a one job? Like that seems like a beautifully simple thing for the students to be able to be like, okay, I got that. But basically in the rubric, I got all yeah. four. And these right? are going to be the categories, actually. So there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Right. Which, you're right, six is fewer than 100. Yeah. And it gives that broad enough range up to the hundredths that gives me some flexibility. And so here's a good example where that comes into play. I work into all of my class uh, grading schemes a certain percentage for class participation. Be on time or early for class, um, complete assignments on time, contribute to any online uh, uh, expectations, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things under the category of, of class participation. When it comes down to that, and I've got a student who's a cumulative, whose cumulative uh, GPA points to date have been 3.75, and they have been on time or early for class, their assignments are on time, or it's likely their class participation, participation grade on that four point on scale will push them over the 374. And I have enough flexibility in there with that hundredths to do that. So it's less subjective. It's based on that rubric of here's what makes up an A in class participation. I also factor in another weighted percentage. It's usually 5 to 10% of a student's own assessment of their class participation. So they actually get a say in that. Yes. Now, when I um, compare, you know, what what I would, you know, um, get somebody would be, you know, it's it's um, um, okay. I have eighty three to eighty seven as the range that somebody would get a B. Now, if, if you know, like if, if you flip to the, the comparison and percentage scale of, of, of your four point scale, um, you know, you get, I think, 68%. Any, anything above 68% yeah. or 68.75 over there is a B. I mean, that seems like a big difference. 
you know? It does, but remember this observation that, yes, I am finding a different way to use 100% of the points. And my uh, approach to it, I believe, it's not arbitrary. It's actually based on what's ended up on the official transcript. Right? So it's just a different way of doing that. What I, I'd ask back to you is how, is you, how do you determine that 83 to 87%? How did you determine that? Yeah, I, I was asking myself that. I mean, I, you know. Yay! Mr. McDonald, thank you. Oh, okay, but I, I mean, you know, like, so um, a, a lot of courses in our department use the same scale, great, okay. right, you know, in terms of the points. And so when I came here, you know, 22 years ago, I adopted that scale. Now, you divide the four point scale linearly. Right here. I mean, yeah. but obviously, the, you know, the distribution that I'm using here, or have been using for the last 20 years, is not linear. You know, like, I mean, 80, 83 to 87, you know, is, is quite different from, you know, 81 to 60, 69. And so, you know, if somebody were to look at your grade distribution over there, they would be very happy to take your course, mm -hmm. you know, because if, if you get a 69%, I mean, a 69% would, would put you in a D range, the way I would apply it in my scheme. Based on 100%. My yeah, is based but, or 100 points. That yeah, 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 yeah. Mine is based on four points, which is a different way of doing it. So if you think about 100% on my four point, in a way, it is the same as 100% on 100 point. I've just categorized it based on the transcript rating. So I would argue that it's no more difficult, nor is it easier to earn a certain grade in this system than it would be in a 100 point, 100% 100 based grading scheme. There's still earning, this is what I mean about that term authentic assessment. They're still authentically earning that BC. They, they did the work that reflected that based on the scale. Mm -hmm. So, it, and that's the, again, you're pointing to me, the challenging thing about a lot of LMS, we default to the 100% all the time based on 100 points, or the equivalent thereof. Some at 1,500 points, some at 1,000 points. It's, mm -hmm. it's all over the map. And what I'd argue is why should it be the case that other professors teaching the same content at UCU and perhaps a, a different section of the same course, why should there B, potentially have a different percentage alignment than yours. So what I think is sort of an interesting thing, this is a, a much bigger discussion, but in a standard 100% grade distribution thing, if you think of this as miles per hour, and this is going back to you know starting from zero and, and stepping <coughs> up those steps, versus going from 100 and counting backwards down to, to 70 or whatever, the student has to earn to has to get up to 61 miles per hour before they're not failing. And in this one, they just have to go one mile per hour before they're beyond zero or 25. You know, so there's a it gives them credit for doing some of the work, but not for reaching that 60 mile per hour threshold before their work starts to count. And that's a different. It's a kind of a funny, I've never understood grading for that reason because um, I guess I was convinced through like, I think of a, forgive me, my, my doctor was in video games. So <laughs> starting off from zero, you just start to get points and those points get you to level one, level two, level three. So I like the idea of starting from zero rather than, all right, first day of class, everybody is earning an A, and work really hard to keep from dipping down below by not doing well. It's sort of a, let's do well, let's do a little bit better, let's do well, and it, it builds up the steps, as you said, rather than counting backwards, as Julie said. And that's the other thing I like about the algorithm in the Canvas grading scheme, is that when you've done your percentage weight at any point during the semester with this scheme, students can find the level that they're at. They can find what they're earning towards the semester grade. So um, if a low weighted 
percentage assignment is uh, they've earned a poor grade for that. They know that in the semester long 40% project they're working on, there's a lot of ways to make up for that. And it also, again, philosophically, gets us away from things like extra credit and things that we, well, whatever. I also think, though, Peter, that you're, you're right. Like, this is a much different class. <coughs> and this kind of goes back to your first point of there are 100 different sections of, of English 101 or whatever, but in every one of them could be different. Your class is different from a lot of the other classes because it's a different paradigm for the students to have to figure out on, on, on day one. And, and my point about what students' feedback has been, um, I, I maybe repeated this too much, but it's not arbitrary. This no. is what they're going to see on the transcript. Mm -hmm. And that math, to me, has always been screwy. How is it that they, based on 100 point, 100 percentage, throughout their college career, and then they see their official transcript grades, and it's this 4.0. Yeah. Why are they doing that figuring? So when students reconcile that as current undergraduates, and particularly as alumni, they're like, oh, that makes sense. Oh, I get it. Oh, okay, that's consistent with what is officially going to be my grade forever. And at the end of the semester, that's what they look at. What yeah. was your GPA in this semester? I mean, for financial aid and everything, so. I, I grew up in the Netherlands, and so we don't have it four-point scale, we have 100%. <laughs> and so, you know, like you, you earn 100 or you earn 80 or you earn 50, and so there's no question of what that means, you know? Right. And what I really like about what you observed is that at least at some point, there seems to have been some professional academic conversation about what is the percentages that we'll all agree on as a department. So there's, there's some, I think, integrity to student assessment that gets closer to authentic assessment versus us you know, living on an island over here and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, some might say that's what I'm doing, but again, it's not arbitrary, it's based on the achievement. So, you really got me thinking here. Um, does, does this philosophy change if you're considering a course where there is a great deal of emphasis put on what a student thinks and how they how they express what they think and how they create an argument and, and in other words there's a fair bit of instructor to instructor subjectivity in how a grade is assigned versus the kinds of things that I teach where there's a right or a wrong answer. Either you you know what mysteriosis does or you don't know what it does, and it's not about how did you express it, it's about do you know what you need to do to go out and be a good infectious disease practitioner? Um, I'm getting really stuck in my head here between sciences and humanities, and it's kind of a fun place to be stuck. Good, good. <laughs> awesome. And, and not to exploit that, I'm so excited to hear that observation. Really, to live for that. So what happens in a lot of content that is humanities-based in curriculum has actually more to do with process. Have you shown that uh, both uh, rhetorically and analytically and with critical thinking, you know, you've applied through your processes of coming up with what you've written and how you presented it, um, have you employed those skill sets that we've been trying to teach all along this semester? and measure through rubrics that reflect are reflected in a grade? Or, you know, has everything been an 11th hour way of completing an assignment that shows very little of that? And you're able to match that to a rubric and say, see how you didn't present your argument or, you know, et cetera. So we're focusing and leaning on and depending on process, which really does matter. I teach, the major I teach is uh, our undergraduates earn a Bachelor of Science degree in community and nonprofit leadership. How do you measure the development of leadership skills or the development of a, of a comprehensive, comprehensive understanding of community? Well, in capstone projects in senior year, when we have a look at this, the curriculum as an arc of an experience, regardless of what level they come in at, we can start to have that. And this goes to backwards design. That's our goal. We work back from there and say, okay, how are we gonna build towards that goal? And it is a combination of both content and process combined. Very, I appreciate that that struggle you're having. There was someone in. 
hand up back there? No. How are we doing? Time? Time? We're doing good. Um, let me talk about the logistics of this. So you had mentioned that it's hard to find a learning management system that actually you can do this in. Um, and Canvas is actually also based on the 100% system. So it's, can you talk a little bit about, and I, I think I had you look over this, and I think this steps you through how to do these things. Um, this is my display, and again, I would type in the answer. I can start yeah. to answer that. Yeah, you start to answer, I'll play this again. Well, um, I don't know why it keeps coming out, but I don't it's this VGA thing. Oh, it is. Yeah. So I, I, where I think that can start in the Canvas grading scheme option is at the building and the editing of an assignment. You have, as you know, when you're setting up the grade in Canvas, here it is. You have that drop down option of how you're gonna display the grade. So if I were to display it by percentages, <laughs> it'd be way off. You know, students are thinking, I, I got a 38%, that doesn't really, that, that doesn't bode well for my grade. Or I got 38% and it's a C, or whatever it is, I'm sorry, I'm gonna scale. So I will uh, default to displaying the grade to the student as a letter grade. And then they revert to the scale that's been published in the syllabus, and I've manipulated Canvas on a 4.0 scale to give that scale. And um, yeah, I don't know if it's worth showing the footnote, but it actually will show, as you saw, the letter grade and then what's on the 4.0 scale. So when I uh, ask this assignment, this is just how I'll do it, is display it as a letter grade, uh, save it. Now, I've got a question about points up there, right? So do you, are your points, are they all four points or are they in the, the two fields above that do you, can you still do 100 point things based yeah. on letter grade, or um, do they have to be four point Well, so, so this, uh, what I like about this question is that it gets to my philosophical point about equity. What if, suppose, in higher education, here on this campus, in a department, we all agree on having a foundational basis for what an A is? What if we actually did that? Then, no, I wouldn't do up, up to 100. I would display his letter and go to points the way I'm doing. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I haven't tried it yet, that's my sort of learning curve too. I'm gonna guess that if I displayed it only as points, the only thing they'd see- I'm talking about two fields above oh, that, I'm sorry. above assignment group two, oh, to the oh, points yeah. of the assignment. Yeah. Are your assignments all worth all four, four points? And, and then they're just weighted differently, so like readings might be four points weighted, but all of readings together are only worth 10% and quizzes are worth 15%. So now you're exploiting my learning curve with Canvas okay. and the grading <laughs> scheme. I'll usually have for one category of grades only one of those categories that cover the points for that category. Um, and I'm still learning about how to distribute the specific assignments within that category of assignments. So uh, like for class participation, I actually grade most of those components throughout the semester as complete or incomplete with the rubric knowing all along what it takes to get an A. Mm -hmm. And then for the actual assignment that's graded on the four scale, uh, that's where I'll plug in the grade for points are. Um, <coughs> and what else I'll do in the narrative comments of grading is that um, some Assignments, if they're in a category of grades, um, I'll say this is work that's consistent with an AP. Um, it seems to complicate it because I honestly haven't figured out the, the good way to distribute assignments within a category of grades. You know what I'm saying? Um, the weighting of the grades and the, or the grade categories. Yeah. So um, I think I have an example of that in here. So get assignments. Oh yeah, um, so they were to have contributed um, to uh, these four online discussion forums. And um, this, uh, I, this is one of my pilots, so I'm sorry it's not showing, but I would assign this as a certain percentage of the final grade. And one of these categories I have is rated on four. 
Um, I don't know how to distribute that for yet. Okay. I'm certain there's a way to do it in the matrix. I'm not that further along. Any other questions? John, it's yours. All right. Uh, other thoughts on grading. How about do you all do grades or wish you could do grades? Or what are your struggles with the grade book? Do you want to jump into the canvas and play around with the distribute points as? <coughs> it was actually really easy to change. Yeah. Just did it. So that process of changing it was simple. Yeah. yeah. It's a matter yeah. of it's the the mental process of changing your thinking that's harder than right. actually changing it. As I was designing the, thinking about this, this session, I was thinking, this is really going to be more of a philosophical active teaching lab than a technical because, yeah, click on grading schemes and you can choose, UW already has a letter-based or GPA-based grading scheme there, but it's different yeah. than, than yours because it's based, I think, on that nonlinear um, Grading versus the earn point, earn point, equal amounts of between the grades. Um, so yeah, but even that's a sort of a weird. Where did that come from? I don't know. I, I you know, education PhD, but I've never really studied the how to get to this sort of. Okay, now you're at seventy percent. So now you're passing. Julie, do you know? Did you <laughs> did you take that class? Did, was that class available? But I would just add what's really cool about your observation, a few folks are saying the same. Yeah, it does really start to take up more headspace to talk through and think through how we're doing authentic assessment with students. And shouldn't that be the kind of conversations we, we should be having? You know, it, it, uh, Glory it's true with a lot of things that I have. I know, I know, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, you know, Glory forbid at the department meeting we ever talked about how we do assessment, you know. Hey, how are you, you know? Julia. Um, so, because you've put a lot of thought into this, I've, you've probably also thought about this. Um, equity and extra credit. What's your take on offering extra credit? I've never done it, won't do it, won't give in. This is how you earn a grade in this class. It comes into play with that. I, I usually have a higher percentage for class participation, um, but I clearly define all of the components of class participation. Um, there are ways to quantify whether or not you've read assignments or if you've read a reading uh, assignment, et cetera. Um, so if you haven't met that minimum standard to earn this, um, you know, then I go to uh, what is happening with our alumni. In our discipline, certainly, in community nonprofit leadership, in our area of expertise, <laughs> There are very few opportunities for extra credit. Um, and it, honestly, I, I think it complicates things. It gets us into much more subjective assessment of students. Because what about those students who, quite frankly, don't have access to what we might call extra credit opportunities? What about those students who are working their way to earn their degree and have 20 hours a week a job and two kids at home and those non-traditional students we have? Where does extra credit fit into their lives? They're, they're uh, many of them, a number of them, are, are swimming to make the grades and earn the grades they're receiving now. I just think it complicates things where we don't need to. That's my. Lane, you have a question? Yeah, I was going to just talk about the glories of extra credit, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually wasn't, but um, <laughs> I just couldn't resist. Uh, you got me. <laughs> no, I was. Um, no, this has been interesting. Uh, I really thought a lot. I've really been kind of worrying about this idea of grades as well, and I really like your. What it seems to be maybe your idea as well of of not treating the students as consumers. That they bought their way into, or not bought, but they they pay tuition, so they. You know, they're now consuming this course. They have decided to join your course. They paid tuition, so they paid money for it. They're at 100% automatically because they've paid up, and now you have to tell them, you have to legitimize why you're gonna move down. Why you're gonna move down from 100% down to a 90, or every single percentage point is something you have to negotiate with them. And, and thinking more of the grading system is everyone starts at nothing, and you aren't a consumer. You're in this course as trying to learn something more. You're trying to move up and starting at a certain I think thinking philosophically of how we communicate that to students is really important. Um, and I think that 
so it's something that I've struggled with as well. And I, the video game analogy is very apropos, John, because often the people I hear talking about this most are in the gaming and learning society folks, so the people that are really thinking about, we want to master what we're going to get. Um, we are, we're trying to work towards a mastery, not start at some sort of 100%, now we, you take away a percentage because they haven't, they've done something wrong. It's more, you have to do something right um, to move up. And uh, like a video game, you have to either you defeat Ganon in Zelda or you don't. It's either one or the other. You have to master up toward that. So, and it's a really, it's sometimes it's, it's just important to think about that when you're grading yourself because you often try to get into this trap. You get into this trap of like, oh no, I have to legitimize why I gave Susie an 89 and not a 90. And what am I? What am I doing? Like, no, she did earn that. She did get to that next step, and so it's it's kind of a different way of thinking about it. I think there's something about like in the educational term constructivism or constructionism, mm -hmm. and the idea of learning outcomes. Like, what are the things? What is the <coughs> evidence that shows that you? So the students can take away um, from your class artifacts or outcomes or evidence of I've built this. And hopefully it aligns, you know, not only did I get this grade, but I've got this some sort of artifact or some sort of evidence that I can then show other people, look, I made this, you know, rather than, oh, I started here and I fell down and now I'm, I'm bad because mm -hmm. I, yeah. I don't. It's the, the, other yeah, the other language I so much appreciate, you can check the tape, I want to be sure of this, but um, I'm very clear about that language and I always talk in terms of students earning grades. Mm -hmm. I don't ever give grades. And I know we say that in trite ways, but there is philosophically a real significant difference that they know from the start. This is how you earn your way to this level. And, and what it also starts to speak to is, as John described you all, you can then do some of the really good, you know, uh, teaching excellence benchmarks of scaffolding learning and being able to build towards um, a more comprehensive understanding to do good backwards design by starting at the achievable course outcomes and work backwards towards all of the activity of the semester that can build towards that. I think that philosophical language or the philosophical approach that's reflected in the language of earning grades starts to do some of that. And I'm never dismissive about that. I've learned that I want to be very intentional with students to talk about the grades they earn and not the grades they earn. It also kind of goes into, <clears throat> I'm a humanities person, right, I'm in the history department, but that's where I'm at. And often though, <clears throat> when you talk about extra credit, like I often do give a form of extra credit all the time in that if a student gives me a paper and it's garbage, I could either say, okay, that's it, and just let them just drop it at that. And I, I feel like, I, well, they've earned a 70 or a 80 or whatever percentage, whatever I've assigned them. Um, but they could do a lot better if I just said, here's an, just keep working at it. And like I, my goal is to get them towards a 4.0. I want them to earn that. I want them to get going. I can either let them stop right there, and I feel like they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to take that feedback that I've given them on that paper and then apply it. They'll just take that feedback, forget about it, and say, oh, crap, I got a 70 on this paper. It's not a, I need to, I want something higher for a grade point average. So often, though, I just I let them go, well, if you want to do it again, if you want to turn this back into it, use my critiques, turn it back in, let's talk about this. I want them to apply what they've, to be able to apply my feedback and be able to take what they've learned from that feedback and then do something with it. So they come out with an artifact that says, ah, I have now mastered this ability or I've now moved towards a, map, a better place of mastery. So it's maybe it's as extra credit or maybe it's not extra credit, but I'm, I often do that because I want them to get towards that, I want them to master up and defeat Ganon at the end, but they have to keep, you know, they have to press start again, they have to start a little over again, they have to keep working their it's way It's the same up. thing as, as letting multiple <coughs> types of quizzes. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. do it till you get it right. Yeah. And maybe there's a penalty, so the second time you do it, you can't earn as much as you could sure. if you got it right the first time. Yeah. Because, you know, so, so that's, but that's not extra credit. But that's yeah. not extra credit. Well, that's I was just saying, a few yeah. things yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, true confessions, I will do that. That depends on the assignment, what the outcome is. Yeah. But I have a question too. So if it is extra credit, is it working towards the same learning outcome? Yeah. I mean, is, it, it's related to the assignment. Yeah. So yeah. you'll find a different way, right. which I think is awesome, or you'll invite the student in a different way for them to uh, express how they've achieved the outcome yeah. or how they've mastered what they're trying to teach. And, and I, 
when asked about extra credit, there's this, it's so rife with different interpretations that a lot of times it can be dissociated from the learning outcomes of the course or the assignment. It's just another thing that, that students can do that uh, in a way, honestly, it compromises the integrity of the semester grade. Why are we in this course in the first place? To learn about strategic planning. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of content to learn related to that. You know, whatever would be extra credit, I would hope that it's done thoughtfully tied to the outcomes of the course mm -hmm. or the assignment. And a way to do that would be, yeah, to offer another big take at it. Mm -hmm. right. Any last thoughts? I had a quick, quick question. I haven't used Canvas for grading. Um, does it give you a, like a, you know, an, a, 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 a current grade for the course? Or is it like, well, we haven't completed this 20% yet, so your grade seems a lot more than it is or a lot less than it is? That's what, that's what I'm saying. Uh, it does. Instructors can set that up to, to do that, to show the, uh, the grade as is. But it also requires some thinking about how you set up your assignments because it can be way off if you haven't set up the assignments all right, right. correctly. To equal the 100% or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It does have the capacity to do that. And, I, and, and honestly, I haven't ventured that far into it. But isn't it in, I've seen it in student view, you can actually set up hypothetical grade or something like that. Yeah. Students can check that very thing. How am I doing so far this semester? Well, because this is only weighted 20%, and you got a B, uh, and there's 80% of your grade yet to be determined, you're standing at for the semester and whatever that calculation is to reflect that. The default, I think the default grade is, it's every all the zeros are treated as just nothing, and then you have to flip, flip a button to trade non-graded items as right. zero, and that'll then, there are everybody's grade point average all the way to the floor, it's, it's like halfway through the course, so. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael. And on your way out, you can fill out.